So before we actually get started with playing notes and tunes and chords, let's talk a little bit about the most, really one of the most important things in flat picking is your right hand technique. And uh, when I first started flat picking seriously, which was about 18 years ago, um, I explored every possible way of holding the guitar, holding the pick, because I knew from, from watching uh, my friends who could really play this style well that you need three things to do it well. You need to be able to play with speed, precision, and volume. And it's hard to do that. So your right hand is kind of like your guitar's vocal cords when you do that kind of thing. And um, so I made a long study of it. And for years and years, I felt there was always a kind of missing link in there. And a couple of years ago, um, I got hooked up with my friend Brian Sutton, who's one of the great flat picking guitarists in the world, and got him to really sit down and spend some time discussing right hand pick technique. And this is what I came away with. So there are lots of ways to do this. Whatever way you choose to do it, you should recognize that there's, there's kind of two components which you always want to be there. One is relaxation, and the other one is economy of motion. Um, this, uh, uh, Brian's technique really gets both of those. And what we discovered when we talked about it for a long time was that when he plays, there are three important angles uh, that, that have to do with his hand. And the first one is that when his hand rests here and, and he is playing on the strings, there's a little bit of a bend to this wrist. It's not flat out and it's not resting on the bridge pins, okay? So there's this little bit of arch, not very much, but enough. And then the backs of the fingers rest on the pick guard. And this was a sticky point for me because watching people from the front, you can't see that. And I always thought that he was kind of floating freely in space. But he assured me that he actually keeps connected there all the time. Sometimes it makes a little bit of noise but usually you, you can get around that, okay? So you have this angle. Then the second angle you have is that um, the wrist is dropped a little bit. And what that does is it lets your pick drive through the strings at an angle also. So instead of the string being straight and your pick being straight like that, by leading with one edge of the pick, and Brian leads with the front edge, so the front edge is a little bit down, you cross the strings in a way which, A, makes the pick go over the string more smoothly, and B, um, gives you better tone. So this, it, it, you'll hear, this tone sounds a little clickier if the, if the pick and the string are in line with each other. And if you drop the front end of the pick, you get a fatter sounding tone. So tone is all important and this is good for both of those reasons. So that's the second angle. The third angle is that the pick actually goes down and in to the strings when you're playing downward and up and out when you're playing upward. So you're not trying to make the pick go perfectly smoothly across the string. You go a little bit down and then you pull up a little and out. So if you can see that. So those are the three angles. This angle of the wrist, this angle where the wrist drops a little bit, which um, allows the hand to be more relaxed. And it means that the pick actually moves across the strings in a little bit of an arc, which means that the pick hits the low E or high E string closer to the bridge. If you were strumming across, say, four strings, the D would be a little bit farther from the bridge. Do you see that? I hope you can see that angle. So, and then once you get that, you can spend a little time just practicing. It's nice to just take one string. So you could take, say, your B string and drop the pick through the string and let it land on the next string. So think of lifting up and dropping. And then you want to keep everything relaxed. Drop your shoulders. You want a kind of heavy-handed approach to it. And you can practice on one string like that a lot. You could practice with a little scale.
or you can just practice separate notes and gradually then learn to move across the strings. And what you'll find is that on the high strings, your fingers will be able to curl in and rest on the pick guard pretty easily. As you get more towards the low strings, your hand is going to have to stretch out. And on the low E, you might even let your uh, third and fourth fingers kind of curl onto the high E as a kind of brace point. But most of the time, you would like the fingers to be not extended and planted, which keeps you from moving smoothly and also deadens the, the sound of the face of the guitar. But you'd like them to be curled and kind of sliding on the pick guard so they're used as a sort of depth gauge to keep you in touch with the instrument and um, not inhibit the movement of your wrist. Okay? So, a little talk about that, and then let's talk a little bit about the left hand, too, while we're here in this chapter. So for the left hand, a lot of what we're going to do in this lesson is going to be holding down chords and playing things around them. And whether you're playing chords, or if you're playing scale passages or melodies, I want to recommend that if you don't do this already, that you try and make it a point to make sure that your fingers land right up near the fret wire. So when you play a C chord, for example, if you don't think too much about it, you might just put your hands down like this with the fingers more towards the head of the guitar than towards the body. Easy to get buzzes when you do that because of the amount of leverage that you're not exerting on the string because of the angle of it. If you move up right behind the fret wire, then you won't get that buzzing. Plus, over time, hopefully, your left hand will learn that it doesn't have to press as hard because you have greater leverage on the string there. And as a result, your, your touch will be lighter, and that translates into a smoother, more lively musical sound. Okay? So um, the other thing, let's talk about just briefly, back to the right hand again, is where the arm is placed. Now, for me, coming at, a, at flat picking out of a finger picking background, I figured, well, right in the middle of the, of the sound hole, that'll be a really nice, rich, warm sound. And what I learned over time is two things. One is most flat picking, especially if it's in the bluegrass mode, they don't want that rich, warm sound. They want that, that high, lonesome, jangly sound. So, um, and the other thing is that the, the farther you go up the string from the bridge, the more the string actually moves. And as a result, the more, um, the less rebound you get from the string when you go through it. So if you stay down here so that your pick is about at the bridge end of the sound hole, or somewhere in between the bridge and the sound hole, that usually gives you a, a better ability to move quickly over the string, and it'll give you a more bluegrassy tone if that's what you're after. Okay? And in saying this, the music we're going to play today isn't real fast. It's going to be nice kind of singing speed song. And um, uh, so you may not need all of this technique today. But if you want to become an accomplished flat picker, you will find that you can find a technique which may work very nicely at a medium to slow speed, but which will crash you when you try to speed up. So what I'm suggesting is try to get the really good technique right from the start, and then when you do speed up, you won't have to totally reinvent what your right hand does in order to kind of break through the speed ceiling, which might uh, keep you limited in some ways. Okay? So, that's enough of that, and let's start talking about the music. So, the song we're going to use as a model for this lesson is the old Stephen Foster song, Hard Times Come Again No More. And because it's important to know the melody, it's a great thing to actually hear it sung a little bit. So I'm going to sing you a verse and a chorus, <clears throat> and then we'll talk about playing that melody and move on from there into playing it as a solo piece. Let us pause in life's pleasures and count its many tears while we all sup sorrow with the poor. There's a song that will linger 
forever in our ears. Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis a song, the sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days you have lingered around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more.